please do turn in your copy of the scriptures to Isaiah 26 and now before your eye verse 16 to verse 18 for the moment. No introduction this evening, straight to the first point. The Lord's silence in affliction. May I humbly suggest, and this is true, you may not have thought about it in this way, but it is true. The believer's greatest fear is not affliction. It's not. The believer's greatest fear is to lose a sense of God in affliction. The greatest tragedy to befall a Christian is not to be in the grip of hard times, but it's for God to hide his face in hard times. Because the scriptures are absolutely clear uh, that when God's presence and power and face are seen by the believer, it doesn't matter what is against them. Psalm 18, uh, which, uh, is it Psalm 18 you read from Michael this morning? Well, there you go. I, I had chosen to refer to Psalm 18 uh, this evening. Listen to these verses. This is describing what a believer can do, what a believer can persevere through when God is tangibly with them in affliction. Verse 28, it reads, For you, the Lord, will light my lamp. The Lord, my God, will enlighten my darkness. I'm in darkness, but God brings light into my darkness. For by you, I can run against a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. So, to be plunged into trials and difficult circumstances without a sense of God is the horror of all horrors for the believer. And if you have been a Christian long enough, you know that is true. There are times when not only are we plunged into dark times, but we feel alone in those dark times. God feels so far away. Uh, this is, I'm sure, something you can testify, and it's something that the, 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 the saints can have testified since the beginning of time. Read the Psalms. Why have you hidden your face, O Lord? Day and night I cry out to you. So many of the Psalms are the believer expressing isolation in the deepest grip of affliction. Now, of course, one of the wonderful things is when you come through the affliction and you, you come out the other side and you come to more pleasant pastures, Every one of us can look back and go, oh, the Lord was there. He was upholding us. He was, he was keeping us. And we couldn't have gone through it if he wasn't. So we are not saying that the Lord does disappear, that the Lord does leave us. But he does sometimes relinquish his, if you like, intense presence from us. We lose. It's there, but we don't see it. We don't realize it. To experience such desertion. If I could put it like that, when your need of God is at its greatest, is the most difficult thing to endure. Dare I say that it was such an experience that intensified Christ's agonies on the cross. It was more than the rejection of men. It was more than the failure of his friends. The nails in his hands and in his feet. The crown of thorns on his head. It was more than the sufferings in soul and body. What made that the most horrific ordeal for the Son of God was the sense that God had left him. That was what he said in his prayer, right? My God... My God, why have you forsaken me? Now we've got a, there's a mystery to Calvary because in one sense God did forsake him. He laid on him the iniquities of us all. What is hell? Hell is many things. Hell could be said to be men and women suffering the complete and utter withdrawal of all God's goodness. Blessing, grace, common graces, and total isolation. There's no sense of 
There's no the sun warming the skin. There's, there's nothing to experience there which speaks of a good God. And Christ on the cross experienced a silent God. Now, of course, he could not have endured that ordeal unless God was sustaining him. The Spirit gave strength to his body to bear the wrath of God against sin. But it was the Lord's silence that made that so awful. Think of Psalm 22. Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry, but you do not hear. And every true Christian, true child of God has times when they say, why are you so far from helping me? I cry to you day and night, but you do not hear. Now, this greatest fear for the true child of God was in verse 16 to 18 of chapter 26. It was their Israel's experience. It was exactly what they were going through. This was their experience. Israel was guilty of terrible sin. Terrible sin. Rampant idolatry. Total disregard of the covenant and of the promises. Worshipping the gods of the nation around them. Causing their children to pass through Moloch into the fire. This was a terrible time to live. It was an, we think our world is bad. It was, it was just as bad. We, we talk about abortion. They offered their children as sacrifices. This is not a new problem, friends. In order they could be blessed. And God had warned that... He was going to use the wicked empire of the Assyrians to judge the whole land. If you turn back to Isaiah chapter 8, the Lord speaks of Assyria before the event even occurs. Chapter 8, verse 6 to 8. And if you look at our heading, it's titled, Assyria will invade the land at the top of chapter 8. And in verse 6, Inasmuch as these people refused the waters of Shiloh that flow softly, and rejoice in Rezin and Remaliah's son. Now therefore behold, the Lord brings up over the, them the waters of the river, strong and mighty. The king of Assyria and all his glory. He will go up over all his channels and go over all his banks. He will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck. And the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land. O Emmanuel, O God with us. And then the prophet is told to warn the people to not doubt that this will happen. If you look at verse 12, do not say a conspiracy. You know, there are many that are going, oh, this won't happen. It's all a conspiracy theory. Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that these people call a conspiracy. And then in verse 19 to 22, um, or verse, sorry, verse 21, they will pass through it hard pressed and hungry and it shall happen when they are hungry that they shall be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom out of anguish and they will be driven into darkness. Now, that was what Israel was going through as a nation. Question. Was everyone in Israel, every single individual, Christ godless? No, there would have been true believers experiencing this, these calamities with the nation. Obviously, in one sense, all have sinned. And in one sense, all God's people, if you like, by virtue of our sin, we don't deserve anything good from God. But there's a, there's a difference between specific sin that a nation commits that deserves specific judgments. And there would have been many for whom, if everyone was living as they were, these judgments wouldn't have came. They were contrite. They were repentant. When they sinned, they confessed their sin. Uh, they sought mercy from the altar. They brought their offering and sincerely said, Lord, forgive me. They, they tried to shun idolatry. And yet there they were, caught up in this godless nation. And they were going to go into these darknesses, these dark times. Just think about the Spirit, leaving the, the, uh, the, the Spirit of God leaving the temple. When Ichabod was written over the temple. God's people would have experienced the consequences of that. Not just the godless. They were not exempt from national judgment. And friends, we are Christians and we've been saved by grace and our sins have been forgiven and there's now no condemnation. 
But we will experience the groans and the, the fact that this world is a cursed world. Romans 8 verse 22, we, 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 we read this. I'm sure familiar verses to you. Verse 22 to 23. We know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. We groan because of what's going on around us and what's ahead. And we want what's coming ahead. Eagerly waiting for the adoption of redemption of our body. And so when God is judging England, the church will not experience freedom from these judgments. Covid was a judgment on the nation for sure. And the churches were caught up in that, weren't they? Had impacts for us. These are the, these are these are true things. As long as we're in the world, the consequences of sin, death will be felt by us. Tears, pain, sickness, rejection will be known by all God's children. But can I even go further than that? If we follow the man of sorrows, our portion of suffering in this world will be more for many of us, the ungodly. Our Lord said, a servant is not above his master. Would we dare to say that we deserve better fortunes than he who was without sin? We, a few weeks back, um, heard the call to the disciples, follow me. And I didn't have the time to exhaust that of all of its juice. But follow me means... Come after me. Go where I go. Experience what I experience. Share what I go through with me. In fact, I was deeply moved this week when listening to a sermon on um, when the Lord Jesus in his resurrection met with Peter again. And Peter, as you know, has denied Jesus. And... Peter obviously was feeling great shame and probably thought he'd never be used again. He'd never be instrumental for the Lord. And the Lord asked him three times, doesn't he, to correspond to his three denials. Do you love me, Peter? And there's, you know, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. But on the third, on the third question, Jesus says more than feed my sheep. He says, follow me. And my jaw dropped to that as I was meditating on that. Because he took him right back to the beginning, didn't he? When he first, Mark 1, when he, when he first had that call. And he's saying to him, it's okay, you can still follow me. You can begin where you, begin where you began. But then he goes on and says, when you were younger, you used to do what you wanted to do. You used to dress yourself. But when you are older, another will lead you, another will guide you. And you will go where you do not want to go. And then John says that the Lord said that to speak of what kind of death he was about to die. And the very thing he was scared of avoiding when he had the little servant girl says, you're one of him, is the very thing he would experience at the end. He would, he would be called, in following Christ, he'd be called to literally go to a cross. And church history says that he was crucified upside down. Silence in affliction. Can you imagine how... Painful, the silence that Abraham experienced when he was told to offer up his only begotten son. God didn't speak to him until the very last moment. And I can imagine when he's, carry, when he's carrying his son and when they're going to the place and as he's making the altar and his son says, where are we going to get wood for the offering? And, and I can imagine uh, Abraham in his, in his head, those kind of bullet prayers, please Lord, help Lord, please Lord, intervene Lord, do something Lord, surely. And it wasn't until the very end, at the very last moment, God broke in. The silence was what made that affliction agonising. And here Israel expressed in these verses their grief. I'm going to read from another modern translation because as I wrestled with the Hebrew, it's just a little bit clearer. I'm just reading this for clarity because we haven't got the time to, to sort of go through it in detail. O Lord, this is verse 16, O Lord, in distress they sought you. They poured out a whispered prayer when your discipline was upon them. Like a pregnant woman who writhes and cries out in her pangs when she is near to giving birth. So were we because of you, O Lord. 
We were pregnant, we writhed, but we have given birth to wind. We have accomplished no deliverance in the earth, and the inhabitants of the world have not fallen. What are they saying? They're saying this. We've prayed and nothing has happened. All we've got is wind. We have accomplished no deliverance in the earth. Now, what are they referring to there? Well, in the context, in chapters 24 through to 26, are a series of prophecies concerning judgment on the ungodly. In verse 24, we read of an impending judgment on the whole earth. In particular, if you look at verse 21 to 23, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on the high, on high the host of exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and will be shut up in prison. And after many days they will be punished. Then the moon will be disgraced, and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and before his elders gloriously. There's more references to this judgment in chapter 25, verse 2, verse 5, verse 6 through to 9. And then in chapter 26 are wonderful promises of God being a protector in verse 1, a provider in verse 3, strength in verse 4, stability in verse 5. And then you come to verse 16 and 17, we have prayed and accomplished no deliverance in all the earth. We have prayed for you to do what you've predicted to do and nothing has happened and the darkness only gets worse. They speak of being in pain, don't they? In child labour. They're going through agony here. And it's so crippling. This judgment on Israel is so agonising that they can even only utter the whispered prayer. Have you been in such affliction where you can't even say anything or if you do it's just one word, help. You, you can't even put into words the burden that you're feeling. If you've ever been and held a woman's hand in child labour, that's the image you need to have in your mind. Ah! Have you ever felt so desperate that you've almost shouted like that in prayer? Just, oh! Groan inside? I'm sure Christ did that on the cross much. It's when we're there that we're most near to him. We feel and know in small degree something of our Saviour's agony, the isolation, the darkness. And what made it all worse was that they, if you notice that they said that this was of God. This was your chastening, verse 16. This is your chastening. This is something that the Lord himself has done. And again, we're dealing with a mystery here. I am not able and I'm not articulate enough, nor do I even have the understanding to be able to understand how this all works as Christ. In one sense, you could say he knew why God was doing it, and yet he still asked the question, why? And there was something, I think, in his humanity that, remember, Christ wasn't always functioning with his divine omniscience he was acting as a man representing people men and women and there was a sense in which his soul couldn't understand how God could so crush an innocent man why now of course he 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 knew that the Lord had to accomplish his will and he'd agreed to do so and in one sense, though, it doesn't, doesn't take away the question because God is good. And, you know, in times of prosperity and peace, you're able to say to someone, aren't you? You know, God works all things together for good and he, 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 he will sanctify our sufferings and we can say these things. But it doesn't change the fact that when you are placed in the furnace, you say, why? Why? Now, of course, we say with Job... Um, Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not upset accept ver- adversity? Job said that, but Job also asked a lot of questions. Job is able on the one hand to make this profession of faith, but it doesn't take away the experimental confusion. I, I don't understand how to, to join these things up. It's just true. That's just how we feel. And to make it worse, this, this, this silence that they were feeling from God was prolonged. In fact, God's answer to them in verse 20 to 21 is that it's going to go on even longer. He tells them, after they've said our prayers accomplished nothing, he says, come my people, and and here he's speaking to those who are his people in Israel, the ones we've been talking about, those who don't understand why they're caught up in this. 
Come, my people, enter your chambers, shut your doors behind you, hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. Revival's not coming. It's not coming. The indignation will endure for a moment while longer. And, of course, it was, he said, from the vantage point of God, it was a little moment. But from our experience, a little moment can feel a lot longer than a little moment sometimes. Some people have to carry burdens through their whole life. You think of William, I never know if it's Cowper or Cooper. I mean, I don't, everyone has an opinion on this. I've met people, I remember going to where he lived and, and there were different people with different opinions. I'm going to say Cowper. I mean, the poor bloke <coughs> tried to take his life more than once. Um, John Newton and his wife had to care for the man. He lived with that affliction all his life and never got an explanation to why. We know because we've got all his hymns. But he didn't have that answer. And dark nights of the soul come to us. If you've not experienced one yet, you will. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening. Not if the fiery trial, note it's when the fiery trial. Think about a lot of the biblical words in the New Testament. Endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Long suffering, the, the fruit of the Spirit, patience. <laughs> and here's a revelation, dear friends. Not a, not a, I'm not speaking new revelation, no. insight. Um, if one of the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is patience, that makes up the fruit of the Spirit. How are you going to get patience? The Lord's going to have to give you affliction to learn patience. So a lot of the things that God wants to produce in us take time to be experienced. We do not know what times we're in. We do not know the day or hour of Christ's appearing. Uh, we do not know if we're at that point, many people are suggesting, and we may be, Things do seem to be going that way. We do not know whether we're at that point where, when Matthew 24, our Lord says, when lawlessness abounds on the earth, the love of many will grow cold, and then the end will come. And um, we do not know whether we're at that period where Satan is going to be loosed and a, a strong deception is going to be sent among the many. Um, the spirit of the Antichrist will be at work. And, you know, you look around at the, the deception that's going on today and the ludicrous things people are believing. You know, it's not, a, it's, it's not, it's not too far a stretch, is it, to make that suggestion? But the problem is, if you had been uh, John Rogers burning alive at the stake, you would have thought that that could have been the case then as well. There have been many periods in history where God's people have thought that we we're on that point. But nevertheless, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is this. When those lawless times come, when the Antichrist comes, there will be Christians alive at that time. Christians will go through those times. Sorry, we're not going to be raptured out before them. I know as attractive as that doctrine is. We will endure these times. And one of the things that will mark it, it will be God giving a society over and giving a culture over to de de strong delusions so that they will not believe the truth. And we, like Israel, will pray and we'll pray for revival. And we should pray for revival. We'll pray for God to move because it's right to do so. And we will seek to reach out because it's right to do so. But it will be tough times. Now, how does the Lord respond then to this? See there, secondly, the Lord's word in affliction. The Lord's word in affliction. When he tells them, I read to you verse 20, it's going to be for a little moment. The one thing Satan wants you to believe in affliction when he drives your soul mad and maybe even suggests suicidal thoughts. I'm not, we've got to be realistic here. Believers are, are, not, are, not, are not able to sort of avoid these temptations. Elijah was suicidal. You read the text carefully. That's the only conclusion you can draw. He didn't want to be here anymore. When you get to that level of darkness, the one thing Satan does when he, he closes in on your soul is to make you believe there is never going to be an end. It's true. And when we, one of the things that gets us so down is we, we, we feel like this, this problem, this, as they were praying in verse 16 to 18, it's just going to keep going on. But he says to them, it's a little while. The thing you're praying for will come. Verse 1, chapter 27. In that day, the Lord with his severe sword 
great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. All things will be made right. Look at verse 19. You're dead. This is speaking of the Lord's people who are suffering, who are being slaughtered. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. So he's saying, you might feel like they have not experienced all God's blessings and God's promises. They're going to be raised. This is speaking here in the Old Testament of bodily resurrection. God will make right every wrong. Assyria will not win. What he's trying to do here is whet their appetite for the things that are to come. He's trying to loosen their love for this world. He's saying, you're not going to find deliverance in this life. Look beyond this life. Our light and momentary, momentary troubles are preparing for us a weight of glory, the scriptures say. I believe one of the reasons God gives troubles to us in this life is that we would begin to become weary of this life. Now, you've got to counterbalance that to what I said this morning about being joyful. I don't mean we should all walk around <laughs> sort of um, tempting death. <laughs> no, we should be joyful. But we should become weary of this world. We don't want to find our comfort here. There's none to be found. It's so true, isn't it, often that you often maybe pray for a material blessing or a change of circumstance, and sometimes God in his graciousness gives you it, but when you actually get it, it's not what you thought it would be. Has that been your experience before? I've, I've known that in my life. But he gives us over to darkness so that we would see the glory more clearly. You can't see the stars in the daytime, can you? As much as we love a bright sunny day, you can't behold a starlit sky. But when darkness closes in, the stars that were invisible to you before become real to your sight. And it's in the darkness of affliction that the reality of the world to come becomes precious, clear and real. That God becomes more precious to your soul. That is his word to us, that was his word to them. Interestingly, in chapter 26, there's another word of reassurance, isn't there? Lovely words, so, such often quoted words. You will keep, verse 3, you will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in Yahweh forever, for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. This is what we are to do in affliction. He, he brings us into these things. His word to us says, this is all here, so that you would stop looking to these things, that you would set your mind on God. As your pensions, dear friends, perhaps you have worries over them. <laughs> and some of us younger ones with mortgages worry what interest rates are going to do. These are times not to set our hearts and hopes on unstable things, but to set our hopes on the kingdom of God which cannot be shaken. But thirdly and lastly, would you see with me the Lord's heart in affliction? I'm a bit frustrated I've got to stop here, but time hasn't allowed me. I wanted to do another point. But I'm going to finish on this point. The Lord's heart in affliction. There's a difference, and it's quite hard thing to explain to this, but there's a difference between knowing God loves you in affliction and really knowing God loves you in affliction. There's a difference between being able to intellectually acknowledge that he works all things together for good, and in the moment, know that in that very moment, he is working this for your good. If you said to me, do you know that your spouse loves you, that Catherine loves you? I would be, I trust be able to say to you, yes. But that doesn't stop me sometimes in certain situations saying, do you love me? I need to really know it now. I need to feel the force of those words in this moment right now. I need to know how you think about me now. And there are times in your relationship where you need that assurance. You need to know when everything's going loose. 
I remember when there was uncertainty around my future and I felt so guilty that my family were being caught up in all of this. But to hear Catherine say, Tom, I love you and I'm with you, it's all, that, it, it, it's all you need in those moments, isn't it? To hear that from your spouse. And there's nothing more than that we need in affliction. It's not even the change of circumstances, but it is to know, even if we can't understand how or why, that this event, this situation, is an expression of the Lord's love to us. Now, to an unbeliever, that's an outrageous thing to suggest that that tragedy could itself be an expression of God's love. But this is what the scriptures teach. He chastens those he loves. I I have preached on that before, and yet someone just quoted it to me a year ago, and I wept. Because it was just a simple dawning of the fact that I'd preached before, but it was the dawning of the fact that I am being chastened, therefore he loves me. And it it just... It broke me. If you were without chastening, you wouldn't be a child of God. You'd be an illegitimate child, Hebrew says. Who among us that has fathers, that we we, we all, I trust, pray, has fathers that disciplined us? I mean, we're seeing now that 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 point couldn't be made as easily, could it, As, as discipline goes. We need to know what God feels about us. And here in verse 2, the Lord now begins to open, though they've been in darkness, he speaks into the darkness words of wonder. In that day, sing to her a vineyard of red wine. Now, what's going on there? Well, in that day, in the day I judge Leviathan, in the day that I judge Satan, in that end times, God himself is going to sing a song over his people. A vineyard of red wine. Why is he telling them this now? What he's saying is, what God says of you at the consummation of all things is what he sings of you now. Because God does it not change. So he's giving them a glimpse, and he's giving us a glimpse of God's heart towards us and what will become absolutely clear, which we doubt so much now, but then we will see and we will know as we are fully known, God delights in his people. And so what God is doing us is giving us a glimpse in the darkness to what will be clear in the light. I delight in you. A vineyard of red wine. Now just think about some of the, the words here. A vineyard. A vineyard is something that has to be kept with great care and constancy and deliberation and effort. In fact, that goes on in, I'm I'm giving a glimpse of the next sermon, but look at verse 3. I, the Lord, keep it, water it every moment, lest any hurt it. So, So what that means is there's no chaos in our lives, friends. It might feel like chaos, but the Lord's hand in it is purposeful. It is good. But this is saying more than just that. This is a song. Sing to her a vineyard of red wine. Now, in these ancient times, wine was a lot more watered down than it is today. It had a lot less alcohol percentage. So people would drink it in in quite abundance. It would take a lot to get drunk. And and so therefore, it it was a standard drink that people would have in festival and in celebration. It was a time of exuberance. And so he's saying here that he rejoices over you. He rejoices over you. That's what Zephaniah 3 says. He will, so again, present, future tense, something we will experience in the future. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. And he will rejoice over you with singing. And dear friends, if 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 he rejoices over us then... He rejoices over us now because he rejoiced over us in eternity. Because I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. His covenant love endures forever. One modern version translates and says, it's a good good, good explanation of what the word says. The vineyard of red wine, as it translates the red wine, which is a literal rendering, but it translates it as a pleasant vineyard. Wow. The Lord finds us pleasant. The Lord thinks we're wonderful. What a promise for a battered, suffering people. Because when we endure the hardships and we feel that he is against us and it will seem that he's burning in anger towards us and Satan comes in and goes, these things that you're experiencing are because of that failure, that shortcoming, that sin, and God is smashing you because he's, he's fed up of you and you've got to learn a lesson. 
we have to come to this and they had to hear in that day it will be sung to you a pleasant vineyard I delight in you I love you I rejoice over you with singing the Lord chastens every son that he loves and it's a surprising song to be said isn't it interestingly this vineyard um, metaphor is used earlier in the book Isaiah chapter 5 verse 1 now let me sing to my well beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard my well beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill he dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest wine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes. But it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected to bring forth good grapes, did it bring, bring forth wild grapes? Turn back. A vineyard of red wine. A pleasant vineyard. By nature, the first, the description in Isaiah 5 is true of them and it's true of us. We are not by nature anything or anyone that the Lord can delight in and adore and find beautiful. This is a song then that is a song to do with our union with Jesus Christ. It is how God fills with us by a virtue of our relationship to him. He is there singing of them what is true of redeemed Israel, what she is and will be by grace. A beautiful and transformed vineyard. And Christian, as hard as it is for you to believe it, because here's the thing. We feel our sin so close. Remaining sin is so near. I live with it every day. It's strapped to my back. I take it with me everywhere I go. And because we see our sin so clearly, we, cannot, we struggle to understand how God could delight in us. But you see, our sin has been removed in God's sight as far as the east is from the west. He's cast our sin into the depths of ocean and put a sign there saying, No fishing. He sees us as righteous in Christ, not just then, now. He looks at you and he delights in you now, in Christ. And, and even, even, I've got to be careful, this could be misunderstood. I'm not saying he delights in our remaining sin. But even in our sinfulness, it's in our responses to our sinfulness that there is much that delights our Father. When we sin... It delights our God when there are tears of sorrow and repentance. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. When we fall short, or when we make a promise, or when we want to do something for God, and we don't do it as we should do it, or we don't do it at all, and our greatest burden is that we haven't done it, our Lord will say, I just delight that this burden expresses that your great desire is to love me and serve me. And your greatest burden is that you've been prevented from doing so, whether that be by others or by your own sin. When we walk around this world and we feel so lost in it and we, we, we just feel so disorientated with what's going on, our Lord delights in us that we feel out of place in this world and more at home with the people of God. That's his work in us. When we mourn our shortcomings or mourn that we're not what we want to be, he sees wonderful developments in us by his grace. He sees in this room men and women who once only brought forth wild grapes. <laughs> and he delights to see even the smallest little fruitful grape. We are wild by nature, but we have been grafted into the vine. And we stand in him who is altogether lovely. He delights in us as he delights in his soul. But there's one last wonder to this. And I hinted at it. Red wine was a fellowship drink. You see that at the wedding of Cana. Why do you think wine was chosen for communion? 
to have fellowship with God and with one another. Wine is symbolic. Christ's blood speaks, doesn't it, of God being reconciled to us and we to him. And so what he says to us in affliction is, I am doing all of this in your life to draw you nearer to me. The Father delights in us so much that he actually wants to spend time with me and with you. Isn't that amazing? You know, one of the reasons God sends storms into your life is because it's in the storm that you seek him. And he just loves our company. That peacetime and quiet drives us away from him. We, forgetful, we become forgetful of God in a blessing. But it's, it's in adversity. It's, it's when we've lost our way that he sends a great fish to bring us back to himself. This reveals his heart, doesn't it? Here is a God who says to you in affliction, the one thing I want in this is you. Is you. Is us. Oh, that's a comfort, isn't it? That in all of this, and sometimes the reason he leaves us seeking and crying out by day and night and not hearing him is he's testing our desire to seek him. Seek the Lord with all your heart. Well, if you try a few times and give up, that's not with all your heart, is it? If you seek him with all your heart, is to seek him until you find him. It's to not leave off seeking him until he draws near to you. Friends, in these times, we would do well to remember the wonderful comforts of John 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I had one sister, elderly sister, once say to me, um, I don't like some of these modern versions. Because it's changed mansions to houses. I want a mansion. Well, I don't know if it's whether we're to look forward to a mansion or a house. I'd be quite happy for a council flat, if, if anything, in heaven. But what will make it glorious is that Christ is there. And we'll be with him. And we'll be near him. But hold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. I mentioned this this morning, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There's, there's nothing more intimate, is there, when someone wipes your eye? Is that you, don't, you wouldn't let anyone do that, would you? There's only a certain few people in your life, you would allow them to wipe a tear from your eye. What will it be when Christ looks at you and erases the cause of every distress you've experienced in this life? This is what is awaiting us. And these are the comforts that we are to experience now in affliction. We'll close there.